at to transform the way we use energy. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. About seven years ago, General James Mattis, who's now the commander of Sentinel Command, came back from the campaigns in Afghanistan and Iraq and told the Department of Defense, unleash us from the tether of fuel. Well, just last week, we heard that call echoed. General David Petraeus said, energy is the lifeblood of our war fighting capabilities. And he noted that high fuel use means risk for the mission and for each service member and civilian. We can and will do better, he directed. Well, in the years between those two statements, as I think a lot of people here know, the department has taken a number of steps to do better on energy use. But General Petraeus is absolutely right. We will do better, we can do better, and we have to do better. Um, for our deployed forces today, who are fighting the country's fight, but also for the future, for all of our forces that are going to keep the country safe in the future. And that's why earlier this week I joined the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Bill Lynn, who's taking a personal interest in this issue, in releasing the Operational Energy Strategy, which is a strategy for the Department of Defense for how we can improve our use of energy. So I'm going to outline a few of the goals of the strategy and uh, the ways that we're going to move forward on this. But first, the Department of Defense is a very significant user of energy. We are one of the largest single users of energy in the world. We are the largest single user in the country. We account for about 1% of all energy use in the United States, 80% of all federal energy use. So last year that meant we spent more than $15 billion on energy. So my area of focus is on the energy we use specifically for military operations, and that's most of what our energy is used for, about 75%, more than $13 billion last year that was spent on that. And the same energy trends that affect all Americans, that hit us where we live, each one of us, volatile and rising prices, well, they affect the Department of Defense too. We've done some calculations, every $1 increase in the price of a barrel of oil costs the Department of Defense $130 billion. So there are many ways that DOD is just another business and that we worry about our bottom line just like any other business. But there's some, we're also a business like none other. And that's because our product, our process, what we do is security. Our job is to protect the American people. So every military capability that we need to do that job, every mission that we conduct to do that job, and every single service member, they need a steady, reliable supply of energy. Everything does. And ensuring that our forces have access to the energy they need when they need it, it's not easy. Right now, the Defense and Logistics Agency tells us that about 80% of their land convoys in Afghanistan at this particular time are carrying fuel. And that's difficult territory. The terrain itself is hard, the political terrain is hard, people are getting hit by ambushes, by IEDs. Transportation Command told us that this year, in 2010, last year, that we had more than 1,000 attacks on our supply convoys. So taking together these high risks to our people, to our convoys, people have to protect those convoys, the high costs associated with our energy use, it means we must change the way we use energy, and we must change the energy we use. So that's the goal of the strategy. Make sure we've got energy we need to keep the energy safe. Um, I'd like to highlight the points of the main points now. There are three ways we're going to do this. First is more fight, less fuel. We need to reduce the amount of energy that we use conducting military operations. We use far too much of the volume that U.S. forces consume, whether it's on the battlefield, in ships that float in the air or in cyberspace. That's what raises our risks and costs, and it hampers our capability to get the job done. On the other hand, if we reduce that demand for energy, We'll, have, we'll be able to do things that we really need to be able to do, like have better range for our forces, better endurance, stay longer. Uh, the department there is therefore going to take steps to improve the efficiency of our energies, both through technological innovation, and I'm looking forward to looking around and seeing what you've got here. Um, and that could be you know, anything from better engines, more efficient engines, to lightweight materials, but also to ways of doing this. It's what we call concepts of operation that actually Fuel. And an important first step in doing that is going to be collecting better data on how we actually use fuel. We don't know a whole lot about our end use of energy, so we need to understand that better to understand how to apply effort. Well, second, uh, we want more options and less risk. We need a much more diverse range of fueling options and energy supply options. And we also need to make sure that we're doing more to secure our energy supplies. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Right now, the 
capitalize very heavily on petroleum based fuels for our core deployments, for our folks who are overseas fighting. Um, we also support some military operations directly from bases here at home. So those bases are almost completely reliant on the civilian electric grid. So the security of that supply, that electrical electricity supply, is very important for our forces who are deployed. Um, now, we need to change, we need to have better options on the sources. Let me give you a good example of what that might look like, because it's really important at a tactical edge. I'm sure you've heard earlier today or have heard before about the Marine Corps India 3 5 company. It's a company of Marines that's been out in Afghanistan and held on some of the heaviest fighting, and they've been there with energy efficient technologies and solar generation that's taken them off the supply line, both for batteries and for fuel, and that's giving them much better their jobs and to keep more people safe in the fight. And for the long term, we also need to be able to promote the development of alternative fuels for our legacy fleets. We've got equipment, we've got vehicles, ships, and aircraft that are going to be around for decades. And they are run on petroleum. We're going to need something else for those vehicles. So we have an interest in promoting those developments. But as I said, we also have to take more steps to protect the supplies of electricity to our next installations and we're looking at that. So finally, we want more capability for less cost. We need to build energy security in the future force. We've learned the hard way in these fights that we're using too much energy, we're not protecting it well enough, but we're still building this into our force right now. We are building systems that use more and more energy. So we need to get into the way we think about the future, the way we plan, the way we uh, define our requirements, and the way we actually acquire weapons, systems, and equipment. We need to get into all those processes out in energy considerations and the fact that we need to use less energy and have more options. So it's got to be part of how we look at the future as well. So you know, as I mentioned at the outset, it's not just the broader defense trends that we're concerned about the Department of Defense, it's also the broader energy trends. And you know, we're well aware that conventional energy resources are concentrating into fewer and fewer hands and that global demand is growing. And that for us, that means high and volatile fuel bills as far as the eye can see. And it also means national security consequences. Global dependence on oil shapes the geopolitical landscape in our own strategic choices in this country. And it forms our economic security. I can assure you, everyone in the Department of Defense is acutely aware of that. So what all of you here today have in the Department of Defense is an advocate. We understand the benefit of energy efficiency. And we understand the benefit of domestic energy And I'm sure you all really appreciate having an advocate, and uh, maybe some of you are a little more interested in whether or not we'll be a customer. So if you can say a quick word about that. Um, we are, and we will continue to be. You know, as an organization that's charged with advancing the public interest, there are always going to be opportunities to promote larger national goals with the right leadership, like President Obama, uh, Secretary of Navy Ray Davis, we can be an important catalyst in a number of areas. But I'd also urge you to keep in mind that the Department of Defense is in some ways a business like any other, even though our product is unique. And we have to control costs where we can, like any other business, and that's always of interest. So we're always looking for solutions that benefit our bottom line. Where our value proposition is the highest um, is where the military requirement is the strongest, and that's where we can be your best customer. As I said, there are soldiers and Marines in Afghanistan today who are out on the tactical edge using solar technologies and energy efficient technologies. And it's giving them qualities that they need in order to be able to conduct their mission. That's a sustainable, sustained, enduring requirement. So I would urge everyone here that if you want to do business with the military, that you need to be able to look at what we need and what our requirements are and look to that. Then, you know, just a final word on what we believe success looks like for, this, for the Department of Defense. We'll have a military that's better able to respond to any challenge. Fewer of our men and women who are risking their lives guarding the fuel and the battlefield. Our leaders will be able to choose whatever energy source benefits the mission. If it fits the mission, they won't be constrained with single choice. And petroleum will no longer be such a burden on our budgets and our strategic choices. And I sincerely hope that when we improve the energy security of our armed forces, that we'll be contributing to the energy security of the whole nation. So what an honor to speak to all of you, because we're the ones that are making it happen.